We live in a strange time. Extraordinary events keep happening that undermine the stability of our world. Suicide bombings, waves of refugees, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, the mainstream media, social justice, critical race theory, COVID-19, even Brexit. Yet those in control seem unable to deal with it. No one has any vision of a different, or a better kind of future. This is a story about how over the past 40 years, politicians, finances and technological utopians, rather than face up to the real complexities of the world, retreated. Instead they constructed a simpler version of the world, in order to hang on to power. And as this fake world grew, all of us went along with it, because the simplicity was reassuring. Even those who thought they were attacking the system, the radicals, the artists, the musicians, and our whole counterculture, actually became part of the trickery. Because they too have retreated into the make-believe world, which is why their opposition has no effect, and nothing ever changes. But this retreat into a dream world, allowed dark and destructive forces to fester and grow outside. Forces that are now returning to pierce the fragile surface of our carefully constructed fake world. The new system of connected agents which began to predict our behavior had a dangerous flaw. Because in the real world, not everything can be predicted by reading data from the past. Someone that was about to discover this flaw was a man who personified the meaning of hypernormalization. It was Donald Trump. The story begins when a man, called Jess Markham, received a phone call. It was from Donald Trump, and Trump was desperate for help. Markham was a strange, mysterious figure. He had been a nuclear scientist in the 1950s, and studied the effects of radiation from nuclear weapons on the human body. Then Markham had gone to Las Vegas, and became obsessed with gambling. He had a photographic memory, and he used it to instantly process the data of the games as they were played. Because he could predict the outcome, he always won. The Las Vegas gangsters were fascinated by him. Donald Trump was one of the heroes at the age. But in reality, much of his success was a facade. The banks that had lent Trump millions had discovered that he could no longer pay the interest on his loans. Trump's empire was facing bankruptcy. His wife, Yvonne, hated him because he was having an affair with Miss Hawaiian Tropic 1985. It was then that the unthinkable happened. A famous Japanese gambler, Akio Kashiwagi, came to one of Trump's casinos and started to win millions of dollars in an extraordinary winning streak. Trump, who was desperate for money, panicked as day after day, he watched millions being siphoned out of his casino. So he turned for help from Jess Markham. Markham came to Trump's casino in Atlantic City. He analyzed all the data about the way that Kashiwagi had been playing. He then told Trump to suggest a particular high-stakes game that he knew the Japanese gambler could not resist. He predicted that Kashiwagi had to lose, and after five agonizing days, he did. He lost $10 million and gave up. Donald Trump was elated, and he thought he got his money back.
Unfortunately for Trump, before Kashiwagi could pay his debt, he was hacked to death in his kitchen by a Yakuza gang. Donald Trump didn't get his money. Trump's business went bankrupt, and he was forced to sell most of his buildings to the banks. He then married Miss Hawaiian Tropic. In the future, he would sell his name to other people to put on their buildings, and he himself would become a celebrity tycoon. President Assad didn't want stability, he wanted revenge. In December 1988, a bomb exploded on a Pan Am plane over Lockerbie in Scotland. Almost immediately, investigators and journalists pointed the finger at Syria. The bombing had been done, they said, in revenge for the Americans shooting down of an Iranian airliner in the Gulf a few months before. For 18 months, everyone agreed that this was the truth, but then a strange thing happened. The security agencies said that they had been wrong. It hadn't been Syria at all. It was Libya who had been behind the Lockerbie bombing, but many journalists and politicians did not believe it. They were convinced that the switch had happened for the most cynical of reasons that America and Britain desperately needed Assad as an ally in the coming Gulf War against Saddam Hussein. They blamed Gaddafi as the terrorist mastermind. But Assad was not really in control because he had released forces that no one would be able to control. Syria, of course, was unfortunately accused of many terrorist outrage and of harboring terrorist groups. It appears that we have now restored relations with them, as have the Americans. They are now our friends, although we get no real assurances on the past whatsoever. It strikes me as very strange indeed that many of the things we thought were previously the responsibility of Syria have now dramatically become the responsibility of Libya. The force that ten years before he had brought from Iran to attack the West, the human bomb was now about to jump like a virus from Shiite to Sunni Islam. In December 1992, the militant group Hamas kidnapped an Israeli border guard and stabbed him to death. The Israeli response was overwhelming. They arrested 450 members of Hamas, put them on buses and took them to the top of a bleak mountain in southern Lebanon. They left them there and refused to allow any humanitarian aid through. But the Israelis had dumped the Hamas militants in an area controlled by Hezbollah. They spent six months there, and during that time they learned from Hezbollah how powerful suicide bombing could be. Hezbollah had told them how they had used it to force the Israelis out of Beirut and back to the border. The first sign that the idea had spread to Hamas was when a group of the devotees marched in protest towards the Israeli border dressed as martyrs. But it soon became more than just theater. Hamas began a wave of suicide attacks in Israel. Hamas sent the bombs into the heart of Israeli cities to blow themselves up and kill as many around them as possible. I didn't want to believe that under my house there is a bomb. And when I realized it's a bomb, I, I started to cry because it was the first time I saw it in, in Tel Aviv. In doing this, Hamas was going much further than Hezbollah ever had. They were targeting civilians, something that Hezbollah had never done. The tactics shocked the Sunni world. This was something completely alien to its history. Not only did the Quran forbid suicide, but Sunni Islam did not have any rituals of self-sacrifice, unlike the Shiites.
the most senior religious leader in Saudi Arabia insisted it was wrong. But a mainstream theologian from Egypt seized the moment. He issued a fatwa that justified the attacks, and he added it was also justified to kill civilians. Because in Israel, everyone, including women serve as reservists. So really, they are all part of the enemy army. It's not suicide. It is martyrdom in the name of God. Islamic theologians and jurisprudence have debated this issue. Israeli women are not like women in our society because Israeli women are militarized. Secondly, I consider this type of martyrdom operation as indication of justice of Allah Almighty. Allah is just. Through his infinite wisdom, he has given the weak what the strong do not possess, and that is the ability to turn their bodies into bombs like the Palestinians. Instead, in the Israeli election of 1996, Benjamin Netanyahu took power. He turned against the peace process, which was exactly what Hamas wanted. And from then on the two sides became locked. Ever more horrific cycles of human bombs have destroyed the very thing President Assad had first altered. The real political solution to the Palestinian question. It was just after one o'clock and the market was full of shoppers. Streams of ambulances came to carry away the dead and the injured. It was a place of appalling suffering. But even with the first grief came the immediate political impact on the peace process. It's impossible. This moment it will be the end, must be the end of this bloody peace process. In America, all optimistic visions of the future had begun to disappear. Instead, everyone in society, not just the politicians, but the scientists, the journalists, and all kinds of experts had begun to focus on the dangers that might be hidden in the future. This in turn creates a pessimistic mood. And with this mood, that obsession with the future began to spread out from the increasingly irrational technocratic world. What emerged was a fundamental change in our culture, to which everyone became possessed by darkness. The growing collective anxiety became paranoid forebodings of a bleak future. And our movies, television, news, and overall cultural narratives reflected this fact.
It was then that the imagination of Hollywood began to pierce the fragile surface of our carefully constructed fake world. The human bomb was now implemented on a massive scale. It was demonstrated how the terrifying power of this new force could penetrate any defensive system. And it had come to kill thousands of Americans on their own soil. Twenty years before President Reagan had been confronted by the first suicide bombers, they had been unleashed by President Assad to force America out of the Middle East. Rather than confront the complexity of Syria and Israel and the Palestinian problem, America had retreated and left Syria and suicide bombing to fester and mutate. They had gone instead for Colonel Gaddafi and turned him into an evil global terrorist. But in the process, this changed the way people saw and understood terrorism. Instead of a violence born out of political struggles, it became replaced by a much simpler image of an evil tyrant of the head of a rogue state who became more like an arch-villain who wanted to terrorize the world. The politics and power dropped away. The problem was only them and those evil personalities. And after 9-11, this led to a new and equally simple idea that if only you could remove these tyrannical figures, the grateful people of that country would naturally transform naturally into a democracy. 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 democ
because they would be free of the perceived evil. Both Tony Blair and George Bush became possessed by the idea of ridding the world of Saddam Hussein. We owe it to the future of civilization not to allow the world's worst leaders to develop and deploy and therefore blackmail free loving countries with the world's worst weapons. We know they've already got chemical and biological weapons there. We know uh, that they're certainly doing their best to acquire this nuclear weapons technology. If we allow them to do that and do nothing about it, then I think later generations will consider us deeply irresponsible. So possessed that they believed any story that proved his evil intentions, and the line between reality and fiction became ever more blurred. In September 2002, the head of MI6 rushed to Downing Street to tell Blair excitedly that they had finally found the source that confirmed everything. The source, he said, had direct access to Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons program, which was making vast quantities of VX and serin nerve gas. The nerve agents were being loaded into linked hollow glass spheres. But then, someone in MI6 noticed that the detail the source was describing was identical to scenes in the 1996 movie, The Rock, starring Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. A later report into the Iraq war pointed out glass containers were not typically used in chemical munitions. And the informant had obviously seen a popular movie known as The Rock that had inaccurately depicted nerve agents being carried in glass beads or spheres. Really elegant string of pearls configuration. Unfortunately, incredibly unstable. What exactly does this stuff do? If the rocket renders an aerosol, it can take out the entire city of people. Really? What happens if you drop one? Handily, it'll just wipe out you and me. Oh. It's a cholinesterase inhibitor. Stops the brain from sending nerve messages down the spinal cord within 30 seconds. Any epidermal exposure or inhalation, and you'll know. Twinge at the small of your back as the poison seizes your nervous system. Do not move that! Your muscles freeze. You can't breathe. You spasm so hard you break your own back and spit your guts out. But that's after your skin melts off. Oh my God. Well, I think we'd like God on our side at the moment, don't you? There is a threat from Saddam Hussein, and the weapons of mass destruction that he has acquired is not in doubt at all.